Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners, you can support us on a one-time basis using the Zelle app, and I want to thank Carl for supporting the program that way. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous Assignment have been developed by NBC in the summer of 1949, but because of not being able to find a sponsor and not being able to find a place in the lineup, it was essentially shelved for six months. Then the first Martin and Lewis program was canceled, and NBC reshuffled its lineup, and a place was found for Dangerous Assignment. And this was the first episode of this new run. The original air date on this episode is February 6th, 1950, and the title is Find Missing Japanese Weapons. <laughs> Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. You sent for me, Commissioner? Yes, sit down, Steve. I suppose you heard about Bill Thorne. Yeah, they pulled his body out of a river in eastern Panama. That's right. Bill was one of our best agents and one of your best friends, Steve. I figured you'd want to take over his assignment. I do. You've got it as of right now. And I'll give you the background quickly. Ruth, uh, how about Steve's credentials? I've got them already, Commissioner. Steve can pick them up at my desk. Good. Here's a setup, Steve. Shortly before the Japanese surrender, an entire boatload of Japanese weapons disappeared. We have reason to think they're hidden somewhere in Panama. And that whoever has them is willing to sell to the highest bidder. How many weapons are involved? Enough to equip three divisions. Hmm. Well, Bill Thorne must have been getting warm. Yes, that's obviously why he got killed. Steve, we can't afford to have a hidden cache of weapons that close to the canal. Who do I work with down there? A Lieutenant Peters of the National Police in Panama City. Any other contacts who might help me? One. His name is Emil Fager. Mm. He owns a large plantation down there. Quite an influential man. Can we trust him? In this business, who knows? But he has done several favors for us in the past. When does my plane leave? Half an hour. Now, Steve... I don't need to tell you about the danger involved. They've already killed Bill Thorne. They'll be gunning for you, too. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Actually, your job is to find those weapons. Yeah, and find out who killed Bill Thorne. Yes. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment, Steve. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company welcomes back to the air Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Steve Mitchell is en route to Panama City by plane. Meanwhile, on a plantation in eastern Panama, near the forbidding and sinister Darien country, two men sit hunched over a powerful radio receiver. Steve Mitchell departed United States for Panama City. Believe he's taking over the job of his late friend. Hmm. That does not surprise me, Carrero. I did not think they would let the matter of the weapons drop. We will try to give Mitchell the same reception here in Panama that we gave his friend Bill Thorne. Yes. You know what to do, Correro. At the first opportunity. Lieutenant Perez, I'm Steve Mitchell from the United States. Here are my credentials. Mm-hmm. Hmm, si, Senor Mitchell. They appear to be in order. You've just arrived? Yeah, my plane landed about a half an hour ago. 
Please, sit down, senor. Thanks. Say, uh, is it always this hot in Panama? Oh, no, senor. It gets much hotter than this. Mm, great. <laughs> I uh, presume you wish information about senor Bill Thorne? That's right. Well, I'm afraid there is very little I can tell you, senor. Thorne's body was recovered from a river in the Darien country in eastern Panama. Was he already dead when he was pulled out of the river? No, not quite, but he lasted only a few seconds more. Look, uh, was he able to say anything at all about what had happened? No, senor. He only mumbled something about San Miguel. Then he died. San Miguel? What did he mean? Well, I, I do not know, senor. It is very mystifying. However, there is an Indian village called San Miguel inland in the Darien region. Here, it is at this point on the map. Mm -hmm. well, how would I go about getting to San Miguel? Oh, senor, that is very bad country. What do you mean? Well, the Darien country to the east, it is very wild. One can travel only by train or boat. And the Indians are very savage. Many people who enter that country are never seen again. It wasn't an Indian who killed Bill Thorne. But you still haven't told me how to get to San Miguel. Then you are determined to go? Of course. In that case, I will accompany you. Now, let me see. I think we should notify Senor Fager of our intentions. Fager? See, si. we will journey up this river, and here we will pass through land which is owned by him. Oh. It is customary to notify him when someone undertakes such a trip. Uh, would that be Emil Fager? See, si, Emil Fager. Why, do you know him, senor? I know of him. Matter of fact, I was told I might contact him for help. Oh, he has always been very cooperative about such things. Yes, we will go see him. He happens to be here in Panama City at present. He is staying at the International Hotel. Where's that? On the Cinco de Mayo Plaza in the center of town. We can walk there. In this heat? Oh, but, senor... Yeah, the... yeah, I know. It gets much hotter than this. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> I thought we would find Senor Fager here in the lobby. Uh, that is he, the fat gentleman sitting in that chair by the window. Oh, uh, <laughs> he believes in service. I wish I had a guy to fan me. See, that is Senor Fager. Good afternoon, Senor. Ah, Lieutenant Perez. But I fail to see anything good about the afternoon, sir. With this infernal heat. Well, you should be accustomed to it by now, senor. Oh, I seem to feel it more when I come into town, senor. On my plantation, it doesn't bother me. But here, I must take Pepito and his fan wherever I go. Pepito, turn around. Fan the gentleman. Uh, senor, I would like to introduce senor Steve Mitchell, a correspondent from the United States. Delighted to make your acquaintance, sir. Mr. Fager. Well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Senor Mitchell desires to see some of the Darien country. I have offered to take him up the river with me. The Darien country? Oh, you're an adventurous man, Mr. Mitchell. That region is not generally considered to be suitable for an outing. <laughs> so I'm told. I uh, understand you have a plantation somewhere up there. Oh, see, on this edge of the region, it's fairly civilized there, but beyond lies territory that not even I have ever set foot in. Pepito, you are lagging faster, faster. You know, this is the closest thing to a breeze I've felt since I left home. As we will be passing through your land part of the way, I thought I should ask your permission, Senor Fager. Granted, of course. Glad to have you, gentlemen. At least that portion of your journey will be safe. Would you like me to send one of my men with you? I don't think that'll be necessary, Mr. Fager. Thanks just the same. Oh, at, at least let me put one of my boats at your disposal. Well, you are most kind, senor. Not at all, Lieutenant. As you know, I am always willing to cooperate with the authorities in anything at all. Anything at all. Wow. <laughs> it isn't getting any cooler, Perez. No, senor. As you see, the streets are nearly deserted this time of day. Everyone seeks refuge from the heat. Yeah. I noticed that this street wasn't exactly crowded. Hey, here's a doorway. Let's get out of the sun a minute, eh? Of course, senor. <laughs> what do you know? What is it, senor? Wouldn't you know it? Ten degrees hotter than a turkey's bath, and some joker builds a chimney on his house. Chimney? Oh, but, senor, there are no chimneys in Panama City. No. Look out in the middle of the street. See the shadow of that building across the way? Hmm. Oh, that is no chimney, senor. Chimneys do not move. Hey, that's a man up there on the roof. He's got a knife. Get down, get down. 
It hit the door right over your head. Yeah. Two inches lower and I'd have gotten a haircut the hard way. Did you get a look at him? Just a glimpse of his face. Ah, the roofs are close together in this part of the city. He could be a block away by now. Yeah. <laughs> well, senor, it would appear someone objects to your presence in Panama City. That <laughs> doesn't surprise me much. Well, come on, Perez. Let's get outfitted and start that trip up the river to San Miguel. You know, this is not exactly like boating on the Potomac, Perez. Look at that jungle. I'd sure hate to get lost in there. Oh, it is an easy thing to do, Senor Mitchell. The only trails in there are made by the Indians, and they are well concealed. You uh, say the Indians in this area are hostile? Most of them. There isn't any intrusion on what they consider their country. And, of course, the Indians are not the only danger in there. No? There are always the snakes. Snakes? Oh, yes, senor. This jungle is full of them. Many varieties, but most of them are quite deadly. Oh, fine. (sighs) Well, we should be getting close to San Miguel... We have but a few more hours of daylight, and because of the rocks, it is very dangerous to navigate the river at night. Well, I'm not hankering to be out in this stuff at night. These mosquitoes don't help things either. Mitchell, someone is shooting at us from the jungle. Get down in the boat. You see where it came from? See where it came from? I can't even see where we're going. We must keep control of the boat. Yeah. As soon as he shoots again, I'll take a quick look over the side and see where we're going. Hey, that went right through the boat. Look, Perez. It doesn't matter where we're going. This boat's a death trap. I think we'd better slip over into the water on the other side of the boat here. We'll be a little more sheltered that way. See, si, senor. Look out. Huh? That rock ahead of us. Yeah. Get clear. Get clear. Get... Oh, the boat is done for. Into the water. Okay. Yeah. Perez. Perez, where are you? Right here, senor. You okay? Hey. Try to swim underwater. Head for the other bank. Uh. Perez. Where'd the slug hit you? In the shoulder. Here. Let me get my arm under you. Mitchell, don't try to save me. You are making a target of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Okay. Yeah. Got my arm under you now. But, Mitchell... Shut up and relax. I'm going to try something behind this rock. Yeah. Oh. Senor, I... I am getting weaker. Hold on, Perez. Just a little longer. There. We made it. Good. This rock will shelter us from Trigger Boy for the time being. How are you doing, Perez? Oh, I, I'm afraid I've lost quite a little blood, senor. Well, wad up your shirt and hold it over the wound. See? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. Hey, I can touch bottom here. Look. Just lay over on my shoulder and I'll carry you out of the water. All right. Here we go. We're going to be exposed for a second or two, but we can't help it. There. I don't think he can spot us in this underbrush. How far do you think we are from this village of San Miguel? Oh, it can only be a mile or two. Good. Okay. Come on, get up on my back now. Oh, no, senor. Please do not try to carry me. Leave me here and send help for me. Oh, fine. I'm sure the snakes around here would love to see you. But you cannot carry me all that way. Well, a bit playing piggyback with a sniper after us isn't my idea of fun. But at least we've got the river between us. Come on now. Here, up you go. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see the village yet, Perez? See, si. it is in that clearing just ahead. Good. This is sure the longest mile I've ever walked in my life. Yeah, I see it now. Hey, hmm? all the huts are up on stilts. Uh-oh. Looks like we've got a reception committee coming towards us. The man in front, I think he is their chief. We had better stop here at the edge of the clearing. Okay. Oh. Put you down here. Yeah. There. Loud. Can you stand all right? Yes. I think so. <laughs> Senor Mitchell, yeah. for bringing me to safety, I... Gracias, Senor. Here they come. Here they come. Silencio! Who 
What you want, senores? Some help for my friend here. And some information. You come as friends? Yes. Believe me, Chief, we're in no position to do harm to anyone right now. Blast! See? Si. Have that one's wound cared for? See. Si. Can you walk, senor? See. Si. Come with me. I'll check with you in a couple of minutes, Perez. See, si, senor. Thank you, Chief. What do you want to ask me, senor? Chief, a friend of mine was killed near here a few days ago. His name was Thorne, Bill Thorne. Uh, I remember him. Well, he came to see you? Si, senor. Why? He wanted to ask me about mystery of San Miguel. Mystery of San Miguel? Well, I guess he got killed trying to find out what that mystery was. I've uh, taken over for him. Now, what can you tell me about it? Two, three years ago, mm. 20 of my best men walk into jungle. Mm. Disappear. Never see again. They disappeared without a trace? Si, senor. Well, why did they go into the jungle? White men offer them job working for him in mine in jungle. A mine? You know who the white man was? No, senor. Is the mine around here anywhere? Si. He's down river not far from here. But mine is deserted. Look, would you furnish me a guide who could take me to that mine? Si. I will send Blast. He is best man I have. Thanks, Chief. I'd like to start right now. <laughs> I'd hate to be trying this alone, Blast. You can't even see these trails from ten feet away. Si, senor. We keep them well concealed. We do not wish enemies to use them. You uh, have any idea what kind of work these men from your village were doing at this mine we're heading for? No, senor. Once I saw some of them going down river on a large boat. Could you see what was on the boat? Big boxes. Big boxes, huh? Yeah, that could have been the weapons. Aye, here we are, senor. What? Here's the mine. Where? I don't see anything. Right over there, senor. Hmm. Is that it? See? Si. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't see it. It's all blown over with underbrush. <laughs> sure haven't been operating for a long time. Here, I'll take a look. Hey, the shaft's completely caved in. No chance of finding out what's down there now, I guess. Senor. Huh? The birds. What? We are being followed. What? Are you sure about that? I am sure. What was that? Stand still, senor. Uh, now I see him. Who? Look, over against that tree. Holy smoke, what's that? Iguana, senor. Ig uh, what? Iguana, a giant lizard. You call that thing a lizard? It's five feet long. Si, si. Look at him go. Si, senor. Brother, remind me never to spend a vacation here. Well, uh, wait, wait. Hmm? Birds do not stop singing for iguana. Listen. Yeah, I hear it. Someone coming through the brush. Senor, you get over behind that tree. I will lie beside the trail here with my machete. Okay. Can you see anything? See, si. he's a man. He's carrying a rifle. Probably the same sniper. Quiet. Why? There it comes. No! Brother, you sure made short work of him, Blas. Uh, he would have made short work of us, sir. Yeah. Hey, I recognize his face. That's the guy who chucked a knife at me in Panama City yesterday afternoon. You know this man? No, no, but here, maybe there's something here in his pockets that'll give us a lead on who he is. Huh. Huh. Just this picture. A picture of himself? Yeah. That girl he's with isn't bad either. Well, come on, Blast. Let's get back to the village. Look, uh, I'm going to ask the chief if I can keep you with me to help me take Perez back to Panama City. I've got to get back there and make out my report. <laughs> Uh, 
Steve's report's coming in from Panama City, Commissioner. Good. Let's have it, Ruth. Here you are. Great job you sent me on, Commissioner. Today, to have had a knife thrown at me, been shot at, and nearly drowned. Good luck. You know, that guy can get into trouble easier than anyone I know. Even the lizards are chasing me. He's just irresistible, I guess. Pierre is wounded, but not seriously. Hmm. Located mine, which looked like promising hiding place for weapons, till I found it had been deserted for years. Here's the rest of it. I'm back in Panama City with Perez now. On our way over to the International Hotel to notify Emil Figure about the loss of his boat. We'll keep you in form. <laughs> We are very sorry about the loss of your boat, Senor Vega. Nonsense. It was unavoidable, Lieutenant. And I have other boats. You were both very fortunate to escape with your lives, gentlemen. You can say that again, Mr. Vega. But at least that river was cool. Where did you say this incident occurred, uh, Senor Perez? Oh, about 20 miles past your plantation, Senor. Mm. Yes. This bad country up there makes a perfect hiding place for outlaws and cutthroats. Any idea why that sniper should be shooting at the two of you, sir? Uh, no. No, none. Must have been a nasty wound you got, Senor Perez. See, si, my shoulder still pains, but it is much better now. Ah, uh, come on, Perez. We'd better be going. Si. I'll see you later, Fager. Uh, and thanks again for the use of the boat. Oh, you're quite welcome, sir. It is just unfortunate your adventure had such a disastrous ending. But do not hesitate to call on me again if you need anything. Thank you. I uh, looked up the registration papers on the deserted mine as you requested, Senor Mitchell. Mm, what would you find out? Well, it was owned by Manuel Carrero, and the foreman was Eduardo Avila. Mm, either of those names mean anything to you? No, not that of Manuel uh, Carrero, but I do know Avila. He has been arrested several times this last year on charges of drunkenness. He frequents the bars on the Avenida Central. Good. Let's go over there and see if we can run him down. There is Avila, Senor Mitchell. Over at the corner table with the woman. Ah, oh, well, our luck's good, Perez, finding him in the third bar we tried. Hey, hmm? who's that girl he's with? I do not know, senor. She is just a blue moon queen. A, a what? Blue moon queen. That is what we call them here. Girls who frequent these bars and get men to buy drinks for them. Why do you ask, senor? Because she happens to be in the picture I took out of the dead sniper's pocket. What? Are you sure of that? Hmm? Take a look at it. Here. See, si, you are right. Come on. <laughs> Eduardo Avila. What do you want? As you know, I am Lieutenant Perez of the police. What has that Eduardo done? I will ask the question, senorita. I've done nothing. Were you not once the foreman of a mine up the river near the edge of the Darien country? That mine has not been operated for years. What kind of a mine was it? Why don't you leave me alone? All the time, the police, they arrest me, lock me up. Why don't you leave me alone? All I want is to be left alone. Avila, come back here. Let him go for now, Perez. I want to talk to the little lady here. What you want with me? Take a look at this picture. Who's that man with you? I do not know. Come on, quit stalling. I tell you, I do not know. Senorita, allow me to point out, if you do not tell us, I will have to arrest you. I believe you are acquainted with our jail. I'm certain you would not like to return. Now, who is the man in that picture with you? Correro. What? Let's have that again. Manuel Correro. Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, thanks, senorita. Come on, Perez. Senor Mitchell, Manuel Carrero was the man who was listed as the owner of that mine. Yeah. The same guy who threw a knife at me and was shooting at us in the river. I wish he'd lived long enough to fill in a few details. After you, senor. Thanks. What do you think of this foreman we just talked to, Avila? He impresses me as a man who knows something he is drinking to forget. Yeah. I wonder if he's trying to forget those 20 natives who disappeared from San Miguel. You know, all of this seems to tie into that mine. Have you still got those registration papers on it? See, si, in my office. Good. I want to take a look at them. Here are the papers on the mine, senor. 
As you see, Carrero is listed as the owner of Elias Foreman. But now that Carrero is dead, I'm afraid... Wait a minute. Hmm? What's this? Oh, uh, that is a map of the area surrounding the mine and a diagram of the mine. It is required by law to... Hey. What is it, General? Take a look at this diagram. See? Here's the mine shaft indicated here. Mm -hmm. The one you discovered to be caved in. Yeah. But look over here. Right around the bend of the river. (sighs) Another entrance to the mine. Yeah. A side door. Look, uh, can you get me another boat? Why, of course, but... That Indian guide, Blas, is still here in Panama City, too. Senor Mitchell, you think the weapons are stored in that mine after all? I don't know. That's what I'm going back up the river to find out. We are very near to the shore, senor. Yeah, Blas. I'm keeping the boat in as close as I can. I don't want to miss that mine entrance. We should be getting warm, according to this map. Look, there's a bend in the river just ahead. Yes, senor, I see the entrance. Right, right over there. In the side of the river bank. Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brother, you'd never spot that in a million years unless you knew right where it is. It's all covered with underbrush. See? Okay. Tie up to that branch. We'll take a look. Let's see? Let's see? There. Okay, come on. Well, here we are. It's very dark in town. Yeah. I got a flashlight. I'll go first. <laughs> it's a cinch this part of the mine hasn't been abandoned for years. Look at the footprints in the dirt. Wait a minute. Tunnel takes a turn to the left here. See, it is widening out a little, thing. Yeah, I think... Hold it. Holy smoke. Look at that. Rifles, machine guns, grenades. The works. <laughs> well, I've got to hand it to Carrero. He picked a good hiding place. Let's have a look. Senor, look. Huh? Look on the ground there. The bones, they're all around us. Yeah. Skeletons. A lot of them. Yeah, I guess that solves the mystery of San Miguel, Blas. Twenty men from your village walked into the jungle and disappeared. Twenty men who were hired to bring the weapons here and then were killed to shut their mouths. One of those skeletons, senor. Once was my brother. I didn't know that, Blas. I'm sorry. Senor. Hmm? Somebody is in his mind with us. Well, I'll douse the light. Your light is not necessary. I will finish the illumination. No, no. Stand quite still, both of you. Well, Emil Fager, complete with gun. At your service, Mitchell. Or should I say you are at mine? So you're the big boy in the deal, huh? I knew it was only a question of time until you discovered this entrance to the mine, Mitchell. So I thought it expedient to await you here and give you the reception you so richly deserve. Manuel Carrera was just fronting for you with the mine, huh? He was an employee of mine, and a very inefficient one, as it turns out. Ah, stay close together. I want to keep you both in the beam of my flashlight. This man, senor. Yes, Blas? He is the one who killed the men of my village and my brother? That's right. He's the one, Blas. Wait, you. Stay where you are. Stand back, I see. Watch out, Blas. He'll shoot. What happens to me does not matter. Get back. Drop that machete. I avenge my dead brother. What? Throw your machete. Throw it. He knocked the gun out of his hand. I've got it. Oh, let go of me, Mitchell. You sure? Let go of your right. Now. You okay, Blas? See. See, this one is nothing. Just my leg. Well, this is the second time you've saved my life, Blas. I hope it's the last time. Believe me, I don't want to make a habit of it. Senor, this man, Fager, it would give me great pleasure to kill him. Yes, I know how you feel. But at least he's going to be out of circulation from now on. He's out of the weapon-selling business for good. Well, I guess this puts a new twist on an old saying. What is that, senor? He who lives by the sword shall perish by the machete. <laughs> oh, come on, Blas. Let's get out of here. You 
You have just heard the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Dunleavy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif, with music by Bruce Ashley and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us next week at this time when Brian Dunleavy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Fred Allen visits Bob Hope. Be sure to hear them tomorrow on NBC. Welcome back. Well, a strong episode, and I think it showed Steve's strength as a character which is thinking on his feet in action-packed situations. I think where he saved Perez, that was a really strong scene. And I like the story overall. There were so many different uh, turns as the story went along. I think they, they did take advantage of this being sustained to really have a full plot with a lot of different scenes and elements uh, thrown in. Although I don't think the ending was all that surprising. The scene with the commissioner and his secretary talking. You know, I've listened to these early episodes of Dangerous Assignment before, and this never stood out to me, but having uh, listened to uh, se several episodes now, and also having seen a TV episode where that's not included, it really is standing out as just a way to burn runtime. And I wonder if we're going to hear this go away as the uh, later on the program does get a sponsor. There were a couple of silly points. I'm a little unclear how Steve confused a sniper with a chimney. And if you make that sort of mistake, how exactly have you made it this long as a secret agent? Also, the justification for the villain being uh, at the mine waiting for Steve in the final scene is kind of weak. It's like we want to have this confrontation between Steve and the uh, villain. Well, we'll just say that he figured that eventually Steve was going to get there. I mean, and the thing is, if you are a rich bad guy, you have henchmen for that sort of thing. Still, it's an enjoyable episode. Now, I, I did find out something interesting when I was looking at Brian Donlevy's IMDb. This is not the first time he played a character named Steve Mitchell. In 1938, he starred in a movie called Sharpshooters, an action-adventure comedy where he plays, uh, according to IMDb, Ace newsreel cameraman Steve Mitchell, who gets involved in some intrigue around the assassination of uh, the king of that country. So, maybe that can be viewed as a prequel to Dangerous Assignment. That through the events of that film, uh, yeah, and the war, Steve ended up in his current position. Or it can be viewed as just a coincidence. Uh, regardless, the film is, has a very low rating on IMDb, 4.2 out of 10. I have no idea where I would get it, and with that rating, I'm not certain that I should watch it. But it was just an interesting piece of trivia. Also, at the start of the program, I referenced the first Martin and Lewis radio program. There actually were two of them and they have uh, distinctly different approaches. The first one from 1949 and 50 tried to have a plot about uh, Jerry and Dean uh, running a nightclub. And there were guests, you know, big guests most weeks, but there was some sort of ongoing plot, recurring characters. The second Martin and Lewis program from the mid-1950s really was just pretty straightforward. It was Dean Martin singing, a bit of comedy uh, between the two, and then they would bring on their special guest for the evening and do a, a sketch with them. So while they are generally listed together like if you buy a CD of 
programs. They really are two different uh, productions. All right, well, listener comments and feedback now. And we start with an email from Jay regarding a dangerous assignment. Uh, and he writes in, uh, I hope you're enjoying uh, your vacation. Thanks for organizing a great series of uh, rebroadcasts during your absence. I think I missed Pursuit the first time around. Well, so glad to uh, bring that uh, to you. Uh, Jay says, I'm enjoying Dangerous Assignment, but it's a poor substitute for the man called X. Mainly, I miss Pagon, but Dangerous Assignment is also sloppy compared to the man called X. The Ash and smash alien smuggling ring is set in Portugal, but the locals speak in Spanish accents and use Spanish words like uh, gracias instead of uh, obrigado, which I hope I pronounced correctly is the Portuguese word. Uh, and uh, I, I would point out that uh, Jay wasn't the only one to uh, call this out. Uh, Zhao, I hope I pronounced the name G O A O. Or, um, writes, I like the story. My big, re my reg big regret with this episode is that they have the characters speaking Spanish and not Portuguese. Well, uh, thanks for the call out. And yeah, that is a slip. I did talk about this on the video version, uh, where I'd noticed a couple of things where they had gone with, uh, Spanish spelling of names in the credits for two different characters. But obviously that wasn't an issue in the radio version. There are a few things that I think appear to have misled some folks uh, during the golden age in Hollywood into not noting the differences between Spanish and Portuguese. And on the TV version, I mentioned the uh, filming of The Big Little Jesus, where the boy who came on to play the boy who had stolen the statue of the child Jesus was somewhat dismayed to get this long speech in Spanish because he did not speak a word of Spanish. He was of Brazilian slash Portuguese heritage, but he had a last name that was similar to a Spanish last name, and that led to the confusion. And so he had to work out his lines uh, phonetically, which, you know, I think within the context of the story, really just does show him as just being very nervous. That's always how I took it. But he was kind of nervous because he was going on a national television job having to speak a language that he did not know a lick of. It's like, I hope I got this right. But thanks so much for the call out. And if you are aware of something that Dangerous Assignment gets wrong, let no, we may have gotten spoiled by Rocky Jordan and the Man Called X, which always seem to be very much well-researched and well-thought-out in that regard. Anyway, returning to Jay's uh, email, uh... On a more positive note, I love uh, Sam Spade. When you started mapping out your schedule uh, years ago, were you thinking ahead about Sam saving some of the best for later? Well, that's a good question. To be honest, part of it is the nature of the podcast, where we, you know, go from the first available episode to the final available episode of any given series. It takes a lot of time to get through the popular programs. When I was planning the podcast, I envisioned Monday as a day where we would feature shows that generally had uh, between 50 and 80 episodes. And there, there were a few exceptions to that, like The Thin Man, but that's been the focus of programs we did on Mondays. And some of it was uh, personal taste. I really love Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. I mean, honestly, if someone said, you can have either 15 more episodes of Barry Craig come into circulation or 20 more episodes of Sam Spade, I would choose Barry Craig just as a fan. Because I just really love that program. And so that one I went with first. But I was also aware that it made sense that if we were going to be looking at this, you know, long term, it made sense to have programs that were 
drawing cards that would, you know, get people listening to the podcast mixed in with some series that perhaps they hadn't heard of which for many years meant annoying some people that I hadn't played some programs already. I know that I think I didn't get to Richard Diamond until like uh, season seven or maybe late season six. And I went through years and years of people asking if I was going to play Richard Diamond. And of course, I always intended to. But you want to have uh, programs that can, you know, people will get in uh, to the podcast and hopefully they'll check out your other programs. I also have to say that M. Spade has benefited by us waiting so many years to actually get to playing it. Because for many years, the audio quality of Sam Spade episodes out there was not that good. But I've got a pretty good set of episodes to work off of. You know, it's not perfect. You know, there's still little missing things in terms of them being pre-edited of their commercials. But the sound quality is so much better than what I could have played if I had played it years back. I guess in answer to your question, it was one factor that I thought of, but it was one among many. Always good to hear from you, Jay. And now let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Michelle, Patreon supporter since May of 2021, currently supporting us at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Michelle. And that will do it for today. Next Tuesday, we will be bringing you a previously uncirculated episode of Sherlock Holmes. Next Wednesday, we'll be bringing you an episode of Dangerous Assignment. But coming up tomorrow, listen for Philo Vance, where... I think I like number three. Well, no, I don't know. Seven's a mighty pretty number. I think I'll take seven. Who does the program say is driving seven? Seven? Let me see. Oh, that's Duke Wilson's car. He's quite a driver, I understand. Now, let me look and see who's driving my number three. Number three is Joe Turner. I'll take him for my bet. You have him, my friend. Well, concentrate, Markham, because there's the... They're off! They're off! They're off! They're off. The first sprint of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Making the first turn, it's number six, eight, seven, and twelve, with the rest of the cars bunched in back. They're heading into the first stretch now with the leaders still in the same position. Number three, driven by young Joe That's Turner. My boy. Starting to come up. He's wide of the pack. And number seven, that Duke Wilson's keeping him on the bank and preventing him from getting up top speed. Wilson is crowding number three to the rail and three drops back. Here they come past our broadcasting booth. And number six is giving way to the speed of number, let me see, it's number four. Number four is coming up from nowhere on the near turn and he's leading all the cars with number seven in back of him now and number three laying back in third position, waiting an opportunity of getting between them. There they go, hub to hub, making the turn and coming around at top speed. Here comes number three, making his bid. Number seven, that's Wilson, tries to crowd him off. Wilson's taking the steering wheel. He can't seem to straighten it out. There he goes through the fence. Poor fellow. Nasty accident was in advance. It was nasty, all right, Markham. But I'm not so sure it was an accident. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.